For DrydenWire.com, I'm Ben Dryden, and today we are welcoming back to the show our very good friend, Brian Cole. Brian is the pastor at Oaks Community Church in Drummond, Wisconsin. So yes, that means we will be talking about God on today's show. So if that offends you, please feel free to turn this off and, you know, don't send me hate mail. That'd be fantastic. Uh, Brian, welcome back to the show. What's good, brother? Man, it's all good, brother. Thanks for having me finally again. And it's been a while. It has been a while. Yeah. Uh, we did that 20 part, and you've been on, I think, once since then, but we did that 20 part series about you, like 30 minutes each. You know, I think I'll put a link into that on our website today. But that was, I was looking this morning, our first episode was June of 2022. Wow. That was a year and a half ago. Yeah, time flies. <laughs> oh, yeah, no kidding. Uh, so my mom wasn't able to watch the show live this morning. I think she has an appointment, but uh, she wanted me to tell you hi. And I know that you and my mom uh, have a mutual respect for each other. Out of curiosity, why is that? Where did that start from? I don't know. Since, uh, you know, even even in the in my past, I still always pretty much had respect for uh, our elderly people. Um, just always has. But God has in, uh, heightened that, I think, on this side of things, where uh, even as a youth pastor, I, I, I saw, you know, in the church, there's cliques. <laughs> you got your small kids that are clicking over here and your youth kids that are clicking over here and your middle-aged people clicking and then the old people clicking and nobody's uh, in with each other. And I always have so much respect for our elder saints in the church especially those that have been in the faith most of their lives and just the knowledge and wisdom that they have that we just do not tap into. Um, so I used to have a couple of the elder saints in the church that I was at before here um, come into our youth group and, and imbue some of that wisdom into our youth. So, um, you know, meeting D uh, D Diane, meeting your mom, um, even the first time uh, I, you know, you can just sense the spirit in somebody, and I definitely sense the spirit in her and just the way she talks. You can you can tell somebody by the way they talk and the look in their eyes and just their, their whole personality uh, that the spirit uh, lives in them, and I can see that in your mom. And so I felt an instant connection with her and just her words, you know, her love for the Lord shows through her words, her eyes. And uh, so, yeah, I, I connected with her instantly. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have too many older older saints like that around here. Um, I, I don't think that, that you realize, because she's your mom, um, just the, the amount of wisdom um, that's available to you um, in your mom. So I, I, I wish I had that. I wish I had someone like your mom around here that I could sit down and talk to. Not that we always agree on stuff, but that doesn't matter. You know, I, when somebody loves the Lord that much, man, they got some stuff to say. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you say, you say that, that you yeah. wish that you're my, that also comes with, uh, you know, it's, I've always looked at the hierarchy as God, Jesus Christ, and I know they say, we're not going to get the Holy Trinity here. And then, right. Diane, right, that's a pretty high bar. <laughs> So, but honestly, uh, I 100% agree with you. And thank you for sh sharing that. Uh, it's an absolute blessing. I mean, I, I don't know where I'd be without mom. I, I just don't. I well, mean, you wouldn't be there. What's that? <laughs> well, you wouldn't be there without mom. Well, right? actually, okay. All right. <laughs> Fair point. Fair point. Um, thank you. I, I saw a video that you put up yesterday. Uh, oh, and good morning, uh, Gabe Magnifici. Hey, um I saw a video put up, and I even shared it on my personal page, and I didn't even know what was going on. I still kind of don't really know what's going on. So you're the pastor up at the Oaks Community Church in uh, Drummond, Wisconsin, and I know that you guys do this stuff because you've talked about it on our shows. You've been on, like, I don't know, at least 30 sometimes, about Biker Sunday, and you were saying the this, this like, eight-minute-long, nine-minute-long video that you you know just talking to the camera, which I thought, you know, that's that was that was great that you did it. It's, it's a great way to just, instead of typing things out, just being able to look at the camera and people could see your mannerisms and et cetera, but you're no longer doing the biker Sunday. So one, why? And then two, you had mentioned in the video that, you know, I can't remember if you use the word rumor or not, but there's a lot of things going around and why the, what is going on? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a long story. Oh, but, well, it's a lot uh, to unpack. All right. Yeah. Well, you know, let's just say this, uh, 
my first year here, this is uh, it's June, July, some September will be my eighth year here at the Oaks. So after my fir- my first year here, uh, saw that we had quite a few members in the church that that rode motorcycle. Um, I'm part of a motorcycle ministry. Uh, when I came up here, uh, the chapter of the motorcycle ministry that I'm involved with is called the Faith Riders Motorcycle Ministry, and I was in the uh, Chippewa chapter, Chippewa Falls, where I, uh, I I lived in Stanley before I moved up here. So we had a chapter down there. So when we came up here, we got a few more guys, and we start a a Shawamigan chapter of the Faith Riders, and some of those were at the Oaks Church. So after seeing that and and kind of being in prayer about it, I just felt led. Um, you know, a lot, of, not a lot, many churches have uh, one motorcycle event a year and they're called bike blessings. Oh. Uh, and the only one that I really know around here that does that is uh, the light, oh, what is it, the Lighthouse Church or whatever in, in Hayward, they do a, a bike blessing there. Uh, so a lot of churches do bike blessings and that's just uh, getting the motorcycle riders up into the church and blessing or praying over their motorcycles. And obviously we don't pray for motorcycles. We pray for them. It's a, it's a reason excuse to get them in so we can pray for them and allow them to come and hear God's word, because that's, what's going to, what is going to change them. Yeah, And real quick to interject, isn't that uh, not being a biker myself? If you are a Christian and a, uh, so, well, honestly, someone that looks like you, uh, where do you feel comfortable going? Yeah, that's that's hard in itself <laughs> in in a lot of our modern churches today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that, that's hard. So, um, it really I, I felt led by the Lord that since He has blessed me with a motorcycle and blessed many of us at the Oaks with motorcycles, hey, maybe we can use these things. A lot of a lot of people accuse me and accuse us of. Uh, worshiping our motorcycles. No, we we see these motorcycles as something the Lord has blessed us with, and just like everything else that we think we own, we don't own it. The Lord, the Lord owns it. He gave it to me. I didn't buy it. He he got me that bike, and I just like with anything else in our lives, whatever we get, we use for His glory to glorify Him. That's Amen. the ultimate yeah. purpose in our life is to glorify God in all that we do, including riding motorcycles. So, um, I really felt led. You know what? what if we did this biker Sunday thing and once a month, every month through riding season, we had a a season where we just opened up the church and, and kind of cued the message towards bikers. So we, we did that. And at that time I only had one elder and really the, the, uh, the decisions were on us, but mostly on me. And so I started that. I started biker Sunday. And ever since then, you know, uh, obviously <laughs> the, the biker Sundays are the one time that every time we have it, we're packed out. We're standing room only. There's over a hundred people uh, in there, not just bikers, but a lot of other people, guys that ride that, that come in that don't have motorcycles or uh, bikers that have ridden before and, and too old or, or crippled that, you know, they still come. People that didn't feel comfortable maybe in a church before that come. Um, so we were always packed out and it was the one time now we're an expository church. And what that means is we exposit the Bible, uh, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, we go through the scriptures. So my first four years there, four years, we went through the book of uh, Genesis. And then we went into, I think a year and a half, we were in the book of Revelation. And then we were uh, a year and a half, two years in the book of Exodus. And the one uh, before what we're in now, we went uh, about a year through uh, 1 Corinthians. And now we started the book of Matthew. Uh, So we exposit the Bible. We stopped doing that on Biker Sundays. So we'll we'll go through what we're going through. And then on Biker Sunday, we we step back from that. And I, I do more of a topical... Uh, outreach type of uh, message rather than expository tailored to your audience on those yeah and and i'm not number one i'm not really a topical guy i not that i don't believe in topical sermon but a lot of times you're you're pulling stuff out of the bible that uh uh, contextually 
uh, you're, 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 you're misguided in using that to try and prove your point. What? Or whatever. what? That never happens. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I don't really like, personally, I, I, I don't like to do topical sermons because you, you just have that opportunity to do that and take things out of context to back up and support whatever your topic is. So anyway, we come off uh, what we're about at, at the Oaks to do an outreach. Okay, this is another thing, to do an outreach. Uh, to bring bikers in. And the idea was there's a lot of bikers in our area up here who don't go to church. This will allow us to bring bikers from our community into the church that may not have felt comfortable to go into a church before. So we did it. And after six years, um, this last year uh, of, of doing it, um, we even had them during COVID period. You know, we, we didn't stop church during COVID. We kept going. Um, but this last year, my heart has really been struggling with what we're doing because over the years, and especially in the last year, but over the years, I've, I've heard a lot of things from people, um, only a couple directly others rumors. And one is, oh, yeah, that's that biker church. That's that, but everybody calls us. We're, we 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 have an unfortunate <laughs> label as the biker church. And so unfortunately, it sounds like <laughs> y it was so successful <laughs> right. that you got the label. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because back in my e free, my evangelical free days at, at the other church, um, the Forest Lake District's e free church actually asked me if I would be willing to start a biker church down in the Madison area. And I said, no, I don't, I don't believe in, in separating a certain, uh, a certain type of people into a church. That, that's not what the church is, is about. So, so that was really bothering me that we're known as the biker church because we're not a biker church. We're a church of Christ. And the second thing is a lot of people from our area or not, uh, we're actually fearful of coming to the Oaks because of all the bikes and the bikers. And even one of our congregation mm -hmm. members has a neighbor who's who came to our church for a, a bit and told him the reason I don't come anymore is because of those biker Sundays. And, you know, most oh, most wow. of the people wow. have had a real it's had a real positive impact. Even when I was in, in the church in Stanley, I, we brought the bikers in once in a while and the congregation just loved it because, you know, we, we just have such a negative um, outlook on on our lifestyle on, on the biker lifestyle and, it, and when they get to actually meet these people man especially those of us in motorcycle ministry of coming out of the the nastiest of nasty stuff in the world man i i think i'm not saying that we have a better perception of who christ is but i think we do <laughs> because of, of how uh, you know dangling by a pinky nail at the pits of hell with the stuff we were involved with and christ took us out of that and that's why most of these bikers man they're in church and their arms are in the air and they're weeping and they're wailing because they understand what they've been pulled out from so that is always great to get regular people <laughs> and bikers together and, and show just the, the the fantastic sense of love and and um it's just whatever it is man that they have for jesus christ so between those two things it's really been on my heart lately that our mission in the church my mission as a pastor any pastor what the what the bible tells us what i see in here anyway my job as a pastor is not to uh, bring in outreaches and change things up in the church in order to bring in unbelievers. Okay, that that is not my job. My job as a pastor teacher of, a, of, of God's church is to train and equip God's people, God's saints, to go out and do that themselves. They do the outreach. They bring the people into the church. Okay, that's not my job. I don't preach to unbelievers. I preach to the saints. But in hearing God's word, if an unbeliever comes in there, that's what's going to transform them. That's what's going to bring them to the Lord is God's word. Not my words, not my testimony, not anything else. Okay, so number one, it's going against our mission of the church, which is to build up and equip our saints to go out and, and make disciples of all nations. And my job as a pastor to do that. Uh, so we were coming off mission of what the church is about in order to do that. So it really started uh, being a burden on, on my heart in the last year. And I've really done a lot of praying, like, because I don't think people understand 
biking, uh, mo motorcycle riding, biking, whatever you want to call it, as is photography to me right now, is a huge passion to me. Obviously, secondary to Christ and, and living out my life for him and, and, and making disciples and doing that and just telling people about Jesus. But motorcycles is huge. And, and, and yeah, definitely making uh, an area, a building available to anybody, not just bikers, but anybody, whether you're suit and tie millionaire, which we have a millionaire in our church, <laughs> or the lowest drugs of society, or what we see as lowest drugs of society, the, the crackhead, the meth head, which we have in our church, um, to have a safe place for them to go because we are all one one people in Christ. There, there is no uh, boundaries in, in our lives. There's no races in the church. There's one race, and that's we're the, we're the body of Christ. So uh, it was really bothering me, and I, I finally went to my elders about a month ago, and I said, hey, listen, this is on my heart. You guys know how much I love a lot of us. We really love this ministry and what we're doing with the biker Sundays, but here's what's going on. We've got a label on our church that we don't need. And and that label may never go away because we're always going to have bikes because of a lot of our people ride. Yeah. It, it's just the way it is. So we're, we might always be labeled that it might not change that, but we have a label and we're going against our mission and people are afraid of coming in and our mission on top of, of, you know, uh, training and equipping, uh, the saints of the church to be disciple makers is our community. That's the main thing. The main thing was to get bikers from our community into the church to make them feel comfortable. Now, in the six years we've had these biker Sundays, there's only been one or two people from our own community that were not part of our motorcycle ministry or maybe not even believers. I know one of them is not that comes every year for our special biker Sunday, which is the bike show one. Um, so it was not doing what my intention in the beginning was, which was bringing in mm. people from our community. So number one, we're not bringing in people from our own community. It's only bringing in the ministry, the, the biker mm. ministry people mm. from our area and biker ministry people from other areas. And they may bring their friends, but it's not within our community. It's miles out of our community. And number two, we're making a bad impression upon our community. So with those two things, I, I, I told the elders, here's, here's my thoughts. I've been praying about this. And obviously, I don't want to stop it <laughs> because it's a passion of mine. Yeah. But I am not in this church to make this about me. This is not my church anyway. It's God's church. It's mm. his church. And I need to be um, not only open, but uh, disciplined enough to be able to hear from God, not bring my flesh into this and do what God wants to do here. And I really feel a tugging that God is telling me this season is over. We did that for a while. It did not work. Let's go on to the next season. And uh, so I brought that to my elders. We prayed about it. We talked about it. And I... Uh, uh, oh, 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 before, I, I think I know where you're going with this. Hold on. I want to ask you about this. So sometimes when we pray, uh, I have numerous examples of my own, and I want God's direction. But then... He puts it on my heart of the direction he wants me to go. And I don't like the answer. Yeah. And it's, well, never mind. I'll just do it myself. Uh, clearly yeah. you're wrong on this. You love what this is, the, a Biker Sunday. You absolutely love it. You have a passion for it. So when this was kind of put on your heart, was it immediate going, okay, Lord, I get it. Or eh, <clears throat> I'm just not going to, you know, I'll just put that away for right now. And when he keeps doing it, was this a difficult decision? When it, you it knew was. it's time to make this decision, was it difficult? Was it a long period of time before God kept pounding it in your head? Or was it a one morning done? No, it, it was about a year. Um, and, and, and in my opinion, discernment, <laughs> oh, discerning sure. between your will and God's will is the hardest part of this walk. Yeah. Yeah. It's not everything is made clear, 100% clear. And that's why we have elders. That's why we have three elders, um, because if God's not, if I can't discern if this is from God or my flesh, then I need to bring other brothers and sisters into the, the fold here who uh, have uh, are in conversation with, with God all the time. 
to help me sort this out. So that's why I brought them in. Cause I didn't know, is this something that I just am, am, am feeling guilty about or yeah. is this really from the Lord? So yeah, I went to them and uh, after much prayer and, and deliberation and consideration, uh, we made the decision uh, last week or the week before to um, stop biker Sundays. And there was other talk. There was other talk and they're like, should we keep one? Should we keep the bike show? One that we do, which is oh. huge. I mean, we had <clears throat> outside of 50 motorcycles, one, uh, one of them, usually between 40 and 50 bikes on the bike shows. And there's no, you know, we got car clubs and car shows all over up in our area, but there's no bike shows anywhere around. And that's why we started that. Um, and then we have the color run in October where, um, where we, uh, we started this because of what happened with the first one. First one, we went down to uh, Mellon. What's what's the park in Mellon there? Um, uh, Copper Falls. We went to Copper Falls, did a color run with the motorcycles, invited the church congregation to come with us. And we all, and even though it was rainy and stuff that day, we had over 50 people that ended up coming to that. Mm -hmm. And we fed everybody and, and it was a great time. So every October we do a color run and we do a church picnic at the same time. So we have the bikers and, and the people in the congregation eating together and, and all that. So we were thinking about maybe keeping that. and But none of us felt like that was from the Lord. It's like, I think we need to just cut this off uh, where it is and just leave it alone because it's not what we're, we're about. Um, so I made that, I made that call. Um, and you know, and that, so you just said last Sunday. Yep. So and how did the Sunday, congregation, because I mean, I mean, you don't really know what the community thinks about it unless the community yep. is there in the church. So your community, your church, not your yep. God's church, but you know what I mean, your church. Yep. Uh, the congregation, how did they respond to it? Were they shocked? Were they surprised? Were they like, finally, well, there, there or, was, or was couple... it like, what are we doing? This is actually really awesome. What was their yeah. response? Well, you know, while I, I made the announcement, it was during announcement time, and it was kind of quick. I thought I did a good job at explaining um, within our time frame that uh, why we, we made that decision and told everybody, if, if you have any question about, you know, what we did or disagree with it or whatever, um, feel free to come to us and talk to us about it. Um, there was a few sighs when I, I said it, obviously, uh, because we, we didn't, I didn't make any, uh, I didn't tell anybody about this beforehand. Uh, didn't put it up on Facebook until the congregation heard about it. Um, so yeah, so I made the announcement. It seemed to go well. Nobody really questioned me afterwards about it. Um, so then I, I put it up on Facebook uh, on our, on our, uh, Oaks page that, Hey, we're not going to do this anymore. And if you have any questions, feel free to talk to, to me. Um, and almost within the first hour, uh, there were some comments going up and two of them that I took off from one of our congregation members that made a statement to the effect of, um, Oh, well, if you guys didn't want the bikers, uh, you could have just told us. And I'm like, what, what? why and the, where did that even come from because i'm a biker what what made you say something stupid like that and then put it out there in facebook land and i so i took the, the post down and or not the post but that comment, and, comment and i confronted that individual on messenger and you know said that 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 was out of line and uh, <laughs> why would you think that? Well, you know, uh, the bikers, if, if you guys didn't want us there, you could have just told us. And I'm like, well, then I would have to leave. I, I don't understand where you're coming from. Here's the thing that, that I, I think people aren't getting. And even after I, I did the video even and explained, it's kind of like when you put a post up about Facebook, you're, you're like, um, tomorrow we will not have service, blah, 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 blah. And somebody will write down there, are you having service tomorrow? Really? So all this started coming out about, you know, why are you turning the bikers away and, and why aren't you going to allow motorcycles? And I'm like, did I not explain that that no, nothing? You, you explained it. And I didn't even know what was going on, but you had said yeah. that in the video that people, that bike, you can still come here. We're just Absolutely not doing an actual nothing. biker Sunday specific yeah. message just for them, yep. but they're all still welcome. I mean, it was pretty, yep. it's, the it's bike, pretty comprehensive. The bikes are still going to be there. <laughs> right. it's, hopefully the lot's still going to be full of bikes and yeah. people that have been coming. I'm, I'm sure probably most of them will still come. Uh, it has changed absolutely nothing except for the fact that we are no longer going to come off script of our expository preaching and put out a sermon that's topical and directed at a certain group of people. That's all that's changed. 
we we're taking away the biker Sunday where it's going to be a regular Sunday. Bikes are still allowed. Uh, snowmobiles are still allowed. Four wheelers are still allowed. People with a Whatever Chevy are got. still allowed, or a Ford is still allowed. Yeah. Mean, you want to ride a horse <laughs> Don't on really it care. Yeah. Get on in, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So oh, yeah. now it's been so after that video, it sounds like there's still some more questions. Um, if you had a chance to do this differently, would have you have presented it differently? Or because it sounds like there was at least one or two people that maybe it was a nobody really knew about it as an announcement yeah. during the announcement and. Was there anyone saying, I wish this would have been a discussion or a better way? If you had a chance to do it over again, would you have done it the same way or would you have tweaked some things? I think I would have done it the same way. Sure. You know, because I always, I, I, I try to always, um, just like with my, the messages that I do, I'm not a complicated guy. I don't know a lot of these big words. You know, I know some theological words now and I've been studying it and teaching it long enough where I use them sometimes, but I'm careful about it because I'm a very simple minded person. Yeah, me too. So that's how I was raised. That's how I teach. Um, so I, when I make decisions like this, I always keep in mind, how would I react? How would I want this brought to me? Um, so I keep that in mind when I make these, we make these decisions. None of these decisions at the church are made by me myself. Um, people can get that out of their head right now. It's not about me. Um, I don't ever want to be in that position. And that's why I think God gifted us with elders and deacons and stuff like that. So we don't have to go through this ourselves and, and, and be in a position where everything is on us. And, um, you know, and my elders know that I'm one of the elders and my elders know that, that, that this ain't about me. And there, there might be times <laughs> because for the first year or so, when I was here, most of the decisions were on me. Um, it, I'm still trying to get into the, the mindset that I don't have to make all these decisions by myself and I need to learn how to you know, put some of this over on other people sometimes and, and whatever. But you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is no matter what, you're involved with in life, whether you're uh, on leadership in a church or, or anywhere else, you're always going to get flack and, and nobody's going to agree on the same things. Mm. So, I mean, oh, we've been going, we've been going through a season. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just be straight up. We've been going through a, a season, a two year, about a two year season in the church. Uh, and you don't, these are things you just, I never thought I would have to deal with in a small church uh, in the middle of nowhere, but we've been dealing with what situation with a, uh, a cross in our church that uh, when we when we redid the inside of the the sanctuary during during COVID time, um, the the front of the sanctuary is like this old uh, yeah I've seen that old yeah. wood boards yeah. and they they ground a, a cross uh, in into the boards back there and we have this stream of red LED lights back inside of that that are lit all the time. Yep. And all of a sudden last year, man, uh, some people had a problem with it being red. What? Wait, hold <laughs> So we don't have carpet, so it couldn't be, they didn't fight over the color of the carpet of the chairs, but they were, they were in disagreement about these red lights. And I, I, I was like, they red. didn't come to me with it. I heard it from other people. Of course. And I'm like, okay, well, what's, what's the deal with the red yeah, lights? Well, finally... One of the individuals who had a problem with it, uh, we sat down and had a meeting uh, with this individual, and, and they're like, well, why do you have red lights? And I'm like, well, because, number one, that's what we had. Yeah, they're and on sale. Two, that's why. Just like, <laughs> just like with my red podium and my red shoes that I wear all the time, it represents the, the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, Christ ain't on the cross no more. Uh, yeah, but it's his blood that saves us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that was their thing. And I, I don't know about the other people who never came to me who have a problem with it. And, and I told the person, I'm like, you know, I don't care what color it is. <laughs> Matter of fact, somebody came in one day, uh, you know, I won't get into it, but somebody came in one day and, and they took down the lights and they put up white ones. Oh. And after, whatever, yeah. after time, the, they dimmed. They started getting dim. Oh, sure. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm taking them out. And they, they were up there about a month before that happened. I took them out and put the red ones back in. And uh, I, I told this individual, okay, well, I don't care what color it is. I'll go out and get purple lights. But you know what? Someone's going to have a problem with the purple lights. So I went on about purple lights. But then I, t I sat and I talked to the elders. I'm like, here's my thing. Where does this stop? Because... Someone is going to have a, an issue with any color lights that are up there. 
do we keep taking these lights down and putting up different color lights every time somebody's got a problem with color lights up there? And this is, is this really what we need to be concerned and worried about in the church? And it, it's like, listen, if you're not coming to church with the mindset or being in prayer about, Lord, I'm, I'm coming to have an encounter with you this morning. I'm coming to use the gifts that you gave me to edify the, the, the people in the body. Who, Christ, who can I pray for today? Who can I give a hug to today? Oh, I'm going to bring in this food today for somebody that, that, that may not have food or have the time to cook. If you ain't coming into the church with that mindset, but rather, oh, man, they're going to have them red lights come up. Don't even come to church today. Don't come to our church. We don't need that mindset. We come for an encounter with Jesus Christ. So we, we made the decision not to change the lights because where do you stop? Do you keep changing something every time someone's got an issue with something that doesn't have anything to do with why we're here to the for worship? Uh, so, yeah, it's... So do you think this was the always the case in churches? What I mean is oh, yeah. um, 100 years ago versus today. And today, and it's very easy to blame social media for a lot of things. And a lot of times it is accurate and it's fair to blame social media a lot of things. Our desire to always have to talk about ourselves and let everybody know. I totally understand a lot of these. Uh, uh, the whole picture, I get it. But do you think that is playing a part of it where now it would probably be considered worse than it would be 100 years ago when they're deciding what color the the wood thing, I can't remember what it's called, like where you would tie up your horses. Well, how come right. that's light brown and not dark brown or something <laughs> you know, weird like that? Was that kind of a thing back then? Or is it just because that's the world we live in now and we always have to find and be offended by something and upset about something? Yeah. No, I think it's there's always, you know, we're human beings, man. That, we're human beings. We're in the flesh a lot. We're, and we're prideful. Uh, we all are. It's, it's stuff we struggle with. So, uh, you know, this, I, I did see something on social media, one of these, uh, we're, I don't know, they call them memes or whatever, yeah. um, where, you know, McDonald's can get your, your order wrong a dozen times in a, in, in, in 50 visits and you keep going back there. But if the, the church offends you one time, that's your excuse for never going back or going to a different church. And, and yeah. there's a lot of truth in that, um, because w we tend to, disassociate ourselves from church over something a human being or something yeah, physical that is there. weird it yeah. reminds me of like during covid with the masks yes. where some churches were which i still like the vaccine thing i understand strong opinions totally get it but the mask that never really made any sense to me why that was such a big topic uh but there were a lot of people there were churches like this church says or my church forces you not forces requires you to wear a mask right. and this other church is uh suggests a mask and either way around people would leave their churches yeah. over that yeah and i kind of feel like and you can tell me if i'm wrong on this i kind of feel like if that was the reason that you left you probably left a while ago yeah. that was just your excuse and and you when you said that earlier that that's wholeheartedly the truth brother um, as a matter of fact, when we were uh, talking about this, on our, me and the elders just came back from a, a three-day conference in Minnesota, a, a pastor's conference. Uh, we were talking about that. And we were talking about one of the elders said that the congregation member, member who brought that up, that it was his um, neighbor that was coming to our church for a little bit. And when he said he left because of the biker Sundays, I said, no, he left a long time before that. That yeah. was his use for not coming. Yeah, yeah. Because if you're going to use something like that as a, an excuse to leave the church, then you were already ready to go and you were not. You, church is not about us. It's not about the color or nothing. It's not about the building and stuff. It's about having an encounter with Jesus Christ in a fellowship as the body of Christ. So many uh, lone wolves out there who don't think we need church. Yes, you do. I mean, Christ is the head and you're detaching yourself from the head. We need fellowship. I don't care whether that's in a, what you call a church building or a building that, that, that you think has a 501c3 or doesn't. We do not. Um, I will never allow the government to tell us what we can and can't do. Uh, or in, in your house. I don't care where it is, but you still need to be fe in that's fellowship right. with the body of Christ. You have to. So speaking of... Uh, people going from one church to another, uh, de denominations and non -dom there's non-denominational churches and free churches. And which is a denomination, <laughs> which is not ironic. Uh, uh, Wesleyan, Baptist, Lutheran, yeah. Methodist, Pentecost. I mean, there's so many of them. Yeah. Why? I've never really known. Why are there so many different denominations? I mean, there's Catholicism and then there's 
Uh, I think what the umbrella the umbrella term is like evangelical or Protestant. I don't really know the difference of, of evangelical or Protestant, but you know, because that is separated from the Catholicism. So the non-Catholicism, yeah. those churches. Why are there so many different ones? Well, that's <laughs> that's some that's some church history. I could take a while, but the simple the simple explanation of that is before. Uh, 1500s before the Reformation, before Martin Luther, there was only one church, and that was the Roman Catholic Church. Everybody was a Roman Catholic. Now, when the Reformation happened, uh, you know, there were a couple guys before Luther that, that kind of uh, hit on it. You know, they got killed, burned at the stake. And, um, but, but Luther really was the guy that, that, that the Lord used for the Reformation. And after the church was reformed, um, really out of that was born four major distinctions or I think denominations of the church or the Protestant Protestant nation, I guess, of that. And that was uh, Lutheran uh, for Luther. There was Reformed, there was Anabaptist, and there was Angelican. So there were those major four major ones that, that reformed from the, the Roman Catholic Church. And from there, um, when the poo hit the fan, I guess what you could say, uh, now we have, I've, I've heard numbers everywhere from 25 to 33,000 different denominations. I thought you were going to say 25 to 30. <clears throat> no, 25 to 33,000 different denominations are the, the numbers that are out there. Is that good? Um, here's where it's not good. Here's why there are that many denominations, and it's very simple. Now, the one thing you have, I think we have to keep in mind is that there's a difference between denominations and cults as well. Because cults are those that are completely outside of, of what the Bible teaches, like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, them are cults. Now, denominations are all, every one of them, all denominations are, were divided over the interpretation of Scripture. That's all it's about. If someone uh, comes to our church and um, let's say, you know, because there's a lot of different uh, thoughts or mindsets about something even like baptism. You know, the Presbyterians, uh, R.C. Sproul, one of my one of my all time favorite uh, theologians. He believed in in infant baptism, um, and it's funny because John MacArthur, you know, and and most of us we do not. Um, and John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul are great friends, and and I I really would encourage you to go to YouTube. There's a, a video out there that that there's a debate between John MacArthur and uh, R.C. Sproul uh, about baptism. Two great friends, division in their belief about baptism, who who believe differently about it. But guess what? You can still go to the church and be friends. <laughs> I say this all the time about things when I'm teaching in the church on a non-essential issue like uh, baptism or, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the millennialism or, or you know, is it pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, no-trib? We can all have differences of opinion about that and still be friends and go to the same church yeah. because they're not essential. I have nothing to do with your salvation. I don't, you can't be dogmatic about that because the Bible is not clear about it. So, um, so people might have, okay, well, I know Brian Cole right now. I've, I've been pretty much post-trib guy most of my life. Um, teach, you know, we, we, we teach these things. I, I learn about them to teach them in theology classes. And I have a scale between one and 10 on a scale of one to 10, one being you, you hardly, you hardly adhere to this. And number 10, I adhere wholeheartedly. You can, will never change your mind on this. Last year, I was a seven on being post-trib this year. I'm a two. I'm, I'm starting to lean more towards pre-trib now. Um, but it's it, it, it's something that actually offends people. It's it's something where oh Brian Cole at the Oaks Church is post trib. I am not. I'm going over here to this church where they teach uh, pre trib or mid trib or no trib. Or if there's not a church, I'm going to go start my own church that believes in. And this is how denominations yeah. start. Uh, I want to go over back to church. you had referenced cults and I think you said Mormonism and stuff. Um, that <clears throat> that has to be kind of a, a controversial thing to say without, I know you, you're not trying to be controversial, but if there's a people that are Mormons, my understanding is, you know, they're also good people, etc. whatever. Yeah. How do you define a cult? Is it anything that isn't the teaching of God and then therefore by default 
Because I've actually never heard like Jehovah's Witnesses or uh, Mormonism, etc., put under that category of being a yeah. cult. And again, I don't want to be like really controversial here. I just want to, I've never heard of that before. Yeah, anything, anything that teaches, uh, claims to be part of, of the Christian church or Christianity or God of the Bible, if it's not a teaching of the Bible, it's a cult. So the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons both do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. Right. Therefore, it's a cult because they don't worship the God of the Bible. I've never looked at it that way. And to be perfectly honest, I'm, I'm not sure if I 100% agree with it, if that's okay sure. to say, Brian. Uh, yeah, but yeah. honestly, I've never heard yeah. that before. I would, I think I may actually look at that a little bit more. Yeah. Because uh, that's interesting. Now, again, from that perspective, from a person who is a Christian and believes in the Bible and believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I think that makes sense. I, I think it does. Uh, yeah. There was a church uh, somewhere around here. I was talking to someone that went and it fills in or is a pastor or something. Uh, yeah, fills in as a pastor or maybe was a part-time pastor there. And he was telling me that somehow this came up during this conversation about his sermons. And it said, well, you know, we, we don't actually believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I said, I'm sorry, what? But it's a, a that's what, so what is this denominator? What is the, he goes, no, it's a free church, right? Non-denominational. So how do you get, so, so you, 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 do you do the New Testament? He goes, oh yeah. I'm like, how do you get around like Matthew? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, well, we just don't really get into it. I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, that and is so weird. Yeah, and that's what some so-called, I, and, and, and that, that was probably one of the things you want to talk about was the, was the church's state of the churches. Yeah, I was going to, I did want to make sure I asked you, like, what is the state yeah. of our church and what is the state of Christianity today? And that's that's the state of it, but I, I don't even refer, them are not Christian churches. A, a, anybody right. who, in my opinion. I mean, Christ is the root word there in Christian, by the way. I mean. <laughs> yeah. in, in my own opinion, yeah. um, any any building that people come to and get taught supposedly out of this and don't adhere to this is not a church. Uh, I wouldn't call them a cult. Maybe I, I would uh, because they're not worshiping the God of the Bible. Um, and that's, that's kind of where the state of the church, the, the churches, I use that loosely, man. I know. <laughs> are right now because a lot of these, and, and, and recently just the, the, the Methodists again, I mean, there was a, a video or a, an article I saw here about a month ago where uh, the Methodist Church actually put out a thing uh, uh, saying that they want to be repentant and apologetic about using the terms uh, male and female over the years, and they wanted their their people in their in their uh, congregations to repent of the the use of terms male and female. That that's not a church. That's a cult. That is a cult. You are not worshiping the God of the Bible. Um, so a lot of these churches around now, even the big denomination ones, you know, like the Methodists and some of the Presbyterians and these other places, that Lutherans that have broken off from mainstream uh, Christianity and, and they're cultish now because now they're getting into all this all roads lead to heaven. Uh, you can be with somebody other than a male and a female and, and still have a marriage and all that. That's all, that's all garbage. That's mm. not the God of the Bible. That's not what the Bible teaches. You are not a church. You're a liar. You're, you're deceived. You're headed for hell, and you're bringing other people with you. Do you think that that has to happen, or it does happen, because it's a, 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 that's the way the world is, society is now, and we're going to start losing people if we don't start, I don't know if conforming is the right word. It's the only one I can think of right now. That's not the right word. If we, start, if we don't start adapting uh, look, uh, Catholic Church, I think now says now it is okay to use a condom, for example, where before it was that was considered a sin. Uh, things are changing and evolving, and uh, more and more is being accepted, etc. Is it just because of that? Uh, I mean, the Bible is the one thing, at least in my opinion. It, it, you know, it hasn't really changed. I mean, the Bible is the Bible; it's consistent. Yeah. But it seems like we're all changing. Yeah. And so, if we're whatever they're saying now, whatever denomination. This is what we believe today. Well, 100 years ago, it should be the exact same thing, right? In yeah. theory, it should be the exact same thing you're talking about today. It should be the exact same thing you were talking about 100 years ago or 500 years ago. Yeah. But now it seems to be a little bit different. And I'm kind of curious, where are we going to be if we're still here in 500 years from now? Right. So is yeah, it just well, to try to, we don't want people to leave because, okay, if we can at least uh, accept a few more things, 
that will still keep people here <clears throat> in the, we'll give up the 5% of kind of where we stand. If that means we can keep the 95% here of the good stuff, which is good for you as a, a person in the church, it, it's a kind of a trade-off. Do you think that could be the reason why? Um, I, I know the reason why, and, and that is uh, it's Satan. You know, he, he's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a counterfeiter. And it, 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 he's always been that, always will be that. None of this stuff was an issue before the last decade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of things weren't a, an issue. Uh, even just the, the truth of the Bible wasn't even an issue. Everybody believed in the Bible uh, up to 100 years or so ago. And the more, you know, when the age of reason, the age of science hit, um, we started questioning some things that, that really hadn't been questioned before. And, and then when the postmodern uh, era kind of started, that's when things really started getting twisted and it, it's just going to get worse. People are, are going to be more and more deceived. And, but it, here's the thing that the, the, the devil has had 2000 years of plus of experience. He knows how to get to our flesh. He's getting and, pretty good he, at it. Yeah. And he uses guys like, you know, Joe Olstein and all these other knuckleheads to, to, to go out there and, and seem like a Christian, uh, because why? And why do they have so many followers? Well, because that's what people want. It's all flood. about love and you and how good. wonderful God is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. God is, God is yeah. good. Oh, 100%, is good. right. But we're kind of he missing like the love. other half of what God, God is. is love. <laughs> that's right. He said that. But yeah. he also said, I am holy, holy holy he didn't say i am love 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 he thrice quoted holy 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 and in the hebrew language man that meant hey three times you're repeating something listen up this is important so he made it the importance on his holiness not his love he's still love but he's also holy and he expects obedience not begrudging obedience, like, oh, man, I got to do this in order to follow God and, and get salvation. No, man, he, he took care of that for you. He died on the cross for that. He's obedient for you. He puts his righteousness on you. We don't have to do good to get God. God was good and died oh, right. so we could have that. Uh, you know, what a trade-off. I, I, I have this huge criminal record. I, I did all these nasty things. I, did, I said and did all this against Christ. And he said, no, man, I want that. Don't keep that. Here, let me take that. And here's my robe of righteousness. Now go walk it out and be obedient. Yeah. So now I'm not obedient because, man, I got to follow these rules. I'm obedient because, man, this God did this for me. Are you serious? Do you know? Yeah, he does know. He, he made me, created me. And he wants to take that and, and say, you're all good because I did that for you. I'm going to, same way I want my kids. I don't want my kids to want to stay out of trouble uh, because they're fearful of what dad's going to do right. to them. I want my kids to stay out of trouble because, man, oh, if I do this, you know, I hate how my dad is going to feel about what I did or to come to me after they did something in fear of dad's going to whoop my butt. But no, man, dad's going to be so disappointed in what I did. And that's how the Lord is to us, man. He doesn't he doesn't look at us like, look at this knucklehead. You see what he did here today? Man, a boy, am I going to punish him? No, I'm, I'm going to follow in obedience because, man, I I love Jesus and what he did for me. And for everybody that accepts this free gift, and I get to follow him, I get, and, and these laws that he's got for me to be obedient to these, I want to do it because I love him. And, and, and I also know that, man, he, he wants me to be joyful. He, he wants me to flourish. In order to me, for me to flourish, I have to be obedient. I want that. I want that flourishing. I want that joy. And the way to that is to run his program. So I want to be obedient to him. I want to run his program because he knows better than I do what's going to bring joy in my life. And I tell you what, the first 44 years of my life, man, it did not work running my program. And these last 15 years now, I can't even tell you how full of joy I am. That's what obedience is. And that's what he did for us, man. And that's what we want everyone to experience. Yeah. And how can you? But not, you can't do that by you using. Go through this, but go you can't use it by uh, leaving out fifteen percent of the Bible. It was, the Bible is not a la carte. You can't pick like, well, I like to believe my God is. I like to believe that my what, what? And, no, and that's not how this works. 
how do you even start making that decision? You know, there was a church up the road here. I, I stopped by one time on, on my bike when we were out on a bike or Sunday having ice cream. And uh, I saw some people went in there. It was open. And, and I always wondered what it looked like. And I got to talk. And then, you know, they're one of them <coughs> uh, liberal churches and believe in always lead to heaven. And it's okay to have uh, sure. uh, other people in, in your life other than a male and a female and blah, blah, blah. Um, so when when that started with the ELCA with the with the Lutheran churches getting split and stuff over that, their whole thing was, um, yeah, we believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God, but there's some parts of it that are not. Now, now you're getting into a huge slippery slope that I would never want to get into because number one, who makes the decision of what is inerrant? from God and what is yeah. not and where do you stop with that and the, I say slippery slope because once you say okay you this start, is but this isn't now you're saying this is but this isn't this isn't this that's isn't. right now oh, to be clear it's a little bit different more. if we're talking about Old Testament versus New Testament yeah well you know Old Testament because there's like how many laws were there actually in commandments or uh, like they're like crazy things like you can't like kill a donkey on a Tuesday and leave it in a ditch like, yeah, the Torah and stuff. Like the, there were six hundred and thirty some. Yeah, yep. I mean, right. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's understand. You know, the um, I, I think the key is, and anybody that if you, even if you do or have read the Bible, or if you haven't really in the past, I think the key really is just three things: who's the author, and then understand because that's a very important part. You have to know who's uh, who's writing it, who was it for, yep. and when was this written. Yeah. That's re th those three things. I think that's where it gets confused. Just at the beginning of the show, you had said that some people, you know, they can just use this as like a, the topical uh, pastors and stuff, or even people that are believe in God or don't believe in God. They can find a quote somewhere in the Bible to support something that they believe. Oh yeah. But if you, but what are they missing? They're missing uh, obviously the whole context. But that starts with who is the author, who is it for, and when was it written? Those things are really, really, really important when it comes to scripture. Yeah, so important. That's uh, some of the major outside of Sundays. Um, you know, I've always I've been in seminary for 13 years now, <laughs> not a school, but uh, through mentors. Uh, I get the, the, the same stuff that they teach in seminary. I, I never want to stop learning. I, I'm always learning because none of us really has all this down. But one of the main yeah. things that we uh, teach on our Tuesday night universities or Wednesday nights um, we do school uh, every fall, every every spring. We have theology classes. We have church history classes. We have all kinds of stuff. But the two that we, we push the most and teach the most is bibliology and hermeneutics and Bible study tools and methods, which is just another hermeneutics class. And hermeneutics being uh, the proper interpretation, the proper study of Scripture and how to study it. And that's the one thing that we got to get... I want to get across to, to as many people as I can, something we should all know, because uh, there's a saying that I always used to say, and I never knew where it came from. I went to the pastor's convention this this week, and they, they brought it up, too. Uh, there's a saying that says the, the, the Bible, the waters of the Bible is shallow enough for a baby and deep enough for a, an elephant to, 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 to drown in. Um, it, and, and we never need to, we never should lose sight of that this this book is simple enough for anybody in what christ needs to teach us about salvation now the rest of it <laughs> and there's a whole lot more to salvation than, than you can imagine but the rest of it uh, there's an elephant to a lot of that yeah. there's a baby yeah. to some of it there's an elephant to a lot and so what we teach is proper hermeneutics and what you said there's there's like a chart we use oh. that came from creta house um that, that that's hermeneutical and you start down here on the there, there's a right and a left and then a top middle and the left part is exegesis how do we properly exegete the bible and that's where you start with like you said who wrote the book when was the book written who was the author writing to what was the cultural context what was the historical context all these things then after you have that down you go up to the next part, which is the timeless truths. And that is comparing scripture with scripture on that subject. Has it always been that way? Like, mm -hmm. let's say with the, the headdress. 
Has it always been that way that because a headdress was worn by the women back then because that's what sexually excited men and they use their hair to, to flaunt their sexuality and men were excited by that. They're like, put a hat on, don't do that. Has it always been that way? No, not too many guys get sexually excited over a woman's hair. Now it's right. more leggings yeah. or, or yoga pants or, you know, uh, mini skirts, all that. So now that you compare scripture with scripture and, you know, is this a timeless truth? Now, you can bring it down into our context and say, how does this apply to me? As to where a lot of cults, a lot of um, offshoots, a lot of misinterpretation comes from missing that middle part and saying, okay, Bible says wear a headdress, let's skip all that, bring it over in our context, we got to wear a headdress. Yeah. Or Bible says this, we take it literal, we bring it all the way. So, so part of that middle part also is, man, there's a lot to understand about the, the genre of the, the, the book that you're reading. Because you do not read the newspaper the same way you read the Bible. You do not read right. a book on prophecy the way you read a book in here on history. You don't read a, a letter to the Corinthians the same way you read the Psalms. You don't read the Psalms the same way you read Proverbs because, <laughs> and that's another, uh, the Proverbs. Here, here's one that people take literally all the time and should not because they don't understand the genre. Proverbs, train up the child in the way he shall live and he will not depart from it. Well, my kid just left the faith. Bible's not true. I'm done. Well, the proverb is not a promise. Proverbs are just pithy sayings. That if you do these things, these things yeah. will probably happen. They were like the original Facebook posts, right? These yeah. Just very nice. <laughs> if you do this and this, a lot of the feel-good stuff, and a lot of go, oh, wow, that's good. I'm sharing that so everybody can see yep. that I believe. Yeah, like that was like the original. If you if actually just, no kidding, open up Proverbs and look at it. It's like, oh, this is all the stuff. You've probably seen how much of that stuff actually even on yep. social media. Yep. Like these great quotes and stuff and and I think it should be noted, though, be a little careful with Proverbs. It's not exactly yeah. God's words. Um, yeah. Just be a little careful with it because it's. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, understanding all that, understanding the yeah, genre. Exactly. And, and, and the context. You got to have it. And, and our people, we uh, we are the most in, in our century. We are the most biblically illiterate culture in the world that has ever been. We just are. And, and people in, in our church. Uh, I tell the people all the time, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just a knucklehead human being that the Lord has given a, a gift to of preaching and teaching. I'm still a human. I'm still in my flesh sometimes. That's I'm right. still a knucklehead. That's right. Please do not listen to what I tell you up on this pulpit. And this is why I give people taking home notes with all kinds of uh, suggestions for them to go back and study the scriptures for what we just covered so they can seek out for themselves like a good Berean. That's right. Um, what I just taught to make sure what I taught is in line with what's being taught in the scriptures because I can make a mistake. And all I know is one the one thing that fear I fear most in life, <laughs> other than other people's salvation, the one fear I thing I fear most in life is that because of the gift I've been given and the responsibility of that, the Bible tells me I'm going to be held to a higher standard. And yes, that you got that to look forward to. Literally scares the hell out of me. <laughs> I'm does. like, are you serious, yeah. man? Yeah. Me? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I take it. I take it very seriously. Well, and, I, and I'm glad you do because I think some. I'm not that they don't. I think a lot of people take their job seriously, but I don't know if they take it to that next level. I don't want to yeah. assume that. But you know, I'll leave you with this. Right now, we were talking about the state of Christianity. It doesn't actually bother me at all. I have people that are friends of mine that aren't Christians or don't. Some are atheist. Another's an agnostic. <clears throat> but you know, I still talk to them, and they, they have no problem with my faith. And I, I always try to yeah. throw in a few things here and there, right? Because yeah. And as I've told them, <laughs> if I didn't try to witness to you or tell you about God, that means I literally don't care if you go to hell. Man. And what kind of a friend am I? <laughs> like, yeah. if I truly believe in the Bible and believe this is eternity in heaven or eternity in hell, and you're my friend, why would I not want to try to save you? Like, if I don't try to save you, that means I don't like you, which is a yep. stupid reason. <laughs> but yeah, it's more jokingly. But it's the people who don't believe in God that pull out Bible quotes yeah. and use that and attack Christianity. I'm fine with that, too, yeah. because you don't understand the Bible, so we're having a different conversation. But yeah. it's actually my Christian friends. Yeah. Those are the ones that actually use a lot of the Bible incorrectly. Incorrect. That is actually the part that bothers me more than anything, and I see that happening yep. more and more and more. Yep. 
which is why we need people like you in the church, as Michelle said, for sharing the whole truth. Well, uh, good. Spit and truth, and you've always done that. And it's, I think you've even said before on one of our other shows that you don't be mad at me. I mean, it's, it's not what I believe. It's what the, I believe in the, in God and in, in, in the Bible. It's what, it's what Your God believes. It's like, right? it's yeah. like, you got a problem with the Bible, not me, man. <laughs> uh, Brian, it's an absolute pre- uh, pleasure having you on. I love chatting with you. Yeah, I love chatting with you too, man. Yeah, what do you have coming up this week, this weekend? Um, we're we're in the Sermon on the Mount right now in the, in the book of Matthew. Uh, we'll be in that for a while. Uh, we're going through the the six different uh, uh, parts of the law that the the Lord is saying. You heard it said, but I say unto you. So we're we're talking about some touchy issues, you know, about lust and divorce and and all that kind of stuff, and and God's original intent for that. Um, and, and how the Pharisees uh, warped that out and made an external thing when, when God said, no, it's, it's always been an internal it, thing. Right. Guys just messed it up. That's why he said, you know, it, even to, to think about someone with hate is you're a murderer. Uh, to, to even think about a woman with lust, you're an adulterer. You don't actually need to do it. So we're all adulterers. I'm an adulterer. Oh, a murderer. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I didn't actually kill somebody. Um, but I'm still an adulterer. Every yeah. single person on the face of the earth yeah. is. So I'm no different than anybody else, man. That's and we, well, okay. We so you, that. you're. By the way, you had said I'm just a simple guy. And I don't know a lot of words. You've used like seven words. I literally wrote down. So I'm gonna have to look them up after the show. So I'm like, I don't <laughs> I'm know what sorry. that word means. I don't know what that word means. <laughs> awesome, Brian. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Special thank you to Brian Cole for taking the time to come on for a chat with us today. And, of course, thank all of you for watching. Baron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald and I will be back on Tuesday for our latest episode of Positive Tuesday with Ben and Fitzy. So until then, thank you for watching. And as always, have a blessed day.